Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of having to settle for mediocre are over. Welcome to Project Relationship. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. Join me as I explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to Project Relationship, the podcast. I'm Dr. Julie <laughs> Hamilton, and I'm here with my partner, Ken Hello. Hamilton. And we've been talking all of this first season of the Project Relationship podcast about, well, the, the moves that I talk about in the book, Project Relationship, which is um, subtitled The Entrepreneur's Action Plan for Passionate, Sustainable Love. Now, I wrote this book specifically thinking about entrepreneurs and thinking even more specifically about the position I hold as an entrepreneurial woman. Um, but the thing is, it's a book for anyone who wants to take seriously the fact that they can impact their relationship satisfaction. It's not out of your hands. And this first season, I asked Ken to join me, and we're talking specifically about how we deal with the holidays. And these same moves that we can use throughout the year, we're applying them with the lens of the holidays. And I'm using that in this sort of broad sense, whatever holidays you're celebrating or whatever time of year is busy because it's both joyful or supposed to be and filled with expectation and tradition. Yeah, and this is a holiday rich time of year, but there are lots of other times in the year where yeah, those those expectations come up whether it's whether you do big birthdays or small birthdays or you know, weddings. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's stress. Or in our family, we have the picnic season. The picnic, picnic season, season is a right. big deal. Yep. Um, obviously, it wasn't in 2020, but the picnic season is a great big deal, especially Memorial Day and Fourth of July and um, big family gatherings when when we were growing up in the same, <laughs> yeah, in the same, in the same uh, valley situation there. Um, yeah, you know, 100, 150 people out for those picnics, the same kind of expectations. So we've been talking about that. And this week, we're going to talk about what I call courageous connecting, which is a kind of cute way of saying, <sighs> it's not always going to be easy. But when the pressure is on, when tradition and expectation have entered the picture, what do we do to reach past our fear and connect with our partner, the person who we want to share our world with? And not let the those expectations overwhelm the the connection, the, the plan that you have for maintaining that relationship with your partner. Yeah. So at the holidays, the first thing that comes to mind for me when I think of connecting is, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I I have a lot of um I have some baggage around the holidays and some of that baggage leads me to put you down first. I set down my connection points to you because I'm looking for places to conserve energy. And so I was thinking about how um how easy it has been for me to use the the holidays and needing to get all this stuff done, to use that as a time to not pay attention to you or not pay attention to my other relationships and how how much effort it's taken to decide not to do that. And that's yeah. not, it's not that it's more effort to connect to you. It's that I have to reach past a resistance I have, a desire that even in my extroverted self, this desire to kind of like turn inward and, and clam up and go inside and not share my fears and curiosities and interests. The, the holidays right take a lot of energy. Yeah. And even if you don't have any baggage around the holidays, whoever that mythical person might be, <laughs> you still have the, the, the energy of the expectations. And you were just reading something to me about um, the energy it takes to want. Oh yeah. And we this were is reading all some about David Schnark, who has a, 
um, David Schnorr passed away this year. Oh. Uh, an absolutely a pillar in that. the um, sex therapy world um, with some very interesting ideas about how um, sexuality and intimacy can be changed for the better. Um, yeah, a great loss to the community. Um, I I was reading to you about, yeah, wanting. So wanting has a lot to do with connecting for me. When yeah. I first was dating you, I didn't know, I didn't understand how differently we each wanted. I want in big ways. I tend to go for that like big fiery, like, stating my wants, claiming my, my desires. Um, I'm a flirt. I'm, um, I'm gregarious. You put me in a crowd and I'm just as likely to wind up in the center of it, talking loudly. Um, you, whereas I, my, I'm, among other things, my fear of disappointment is so high that I tend to back off from my wants. There's a whole lot of other stuff that goes in there, but whatever the reasons I don't, I don't embody my wants the way you do at all. Well, so what we were reading from David Schnark last night was about the strength that it takes to want the, the strength. Yep. It's, it's courageous. Um, now, I was raised, my grandmothers told me that it's good to want things. It's a good message to hear. It was a great message. And I internalized it very deeply, so deeply that I didn't even realize that it was there. Um, they would say it's good to want things. Now, they were saying it in sort of a slightly snarky way. They would, you know, if I would if I would be whining about wanting a lollipop, they would say things like, it's good to want things. <laughs> but the message behind it was, yeah, great. It's okay to want things. And you know what? You won't die if you don't get them. It's okay. You know, the they're not your needs. They're your desires. So what are you going to do when your yeah. want is thwarted? One of the things David Schnark was talking about was that you have to let yourself be strong enough to want in the face of the reality that you won't necessarily get it. Mm -hmm. So at this time of generosity of spirit and um, gift giving and high expectations that are really generally almost impossible to meet, how do you find the courage to to want things? Ooh. So the the strength and courage to want things in in the face of all those expectations and the fear of disappointment. Um so you and I spend a lot of time, a lot of time talking about things like this, you know, we're, these are the conversations we record. Yeah. Then <laughs> we, there's all the other yeah, ones. There's all the other ones. And so, uh, over time I have learned that it's just worth it. So, so yeah, you were told it's good to want things. And when I hear that, I hear the implicit statement that comes after it or the question of, so what are you going to do? Yes. That is the question the, behind, right? So and, the, the courage to want and then so honestly, to act to um, the, I got that courage from that message very much, which I had never heard before I knew you. So we, you we've known each other all our, the time. <laughs> we've known each other our whole lives, but our relationship really took a, a big, it leveled up a lot 11 years ago. Yeah. And yeah, I would say that all the time. I would say, well, if you want me, then come and get me. If right. you want to interact with me, you want to go on a date you want to um, go out to dinner, you want to do anything, you want to go for a, a half marathon right now, let, okay, then say so. Yeah. I, the, I was, a, I'm a challenger. I mean, my, that's my, my Enneagram is an eight. I'm a challenger. Um, and <laughs> you're my so response, much more gentle than oh, that. And my response to your challenges has been to strengthen over time. Ah, I used to crumble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you challenge me and I just fall over. Yeah. Uh, and, and I like over to be time, wanted loudly. Yeah. Like everything else that every other kind of strength that comes with practice. And I had not practiced the wanting. And you. I demanded it. Demand, I was going to say require, I but demand it is a good word. We would fight every every week. We would have uh, we'd have a sticky yeah. argument, as John Gottman would say. <laughs> we would have a sticky argument about Thursdays and about the way our Thursdays went, uh, he had to leave for work. I had to run our gym. There were kids to watch and homeschooling to do. And it was just a, it wasn't our favorite day. And we'd have a fight. And it was always about so, it was something ostensibly 
new, but not new. It was the same it was fight not underneath. New. It was the same thing. And one week, you were squatting down, like at the bottom of your squat, hanging out, stretching your hips. Um, and we were f- having this argument. It was really just a discussion. No voices were raised or anything, but the look on my face, I'm sure, was just acid. I was so angry because I wanted you to back up your want. You said yeah. you wished you could stay with us that day. Yeah. And in fact, there was nothing stopping you. Your job is incredibly flexible. Right. You telecommute and you go into the office when you I need could have taken to. Any it number could have been of steps that would have any number. You still had that. two weeks of vacation left mm-hmm. and to use up. So I interpreted what was going on as you acting in accordance with your wants. And that meant if since you weren't going to stay with us that day in the face of me yep. asking you to. Then that was what I, was I like, wanted. And then you're doing what you wanted. Yep. It seemed like it. I look back now and I think, oh, it was more complicated than that. You hadn't yet connected your wants to your actions. But that particular argument, you're squatting down there in what we call paleo chair. Like we would like all the way down at the bottom of your of your squat. And I'm standing and pacing around our office. And I get so frustrated with you that I walk up and I put my two hands on your shoulders and I just tipped you over. Yep. Just pushed just, me over backwards. Just pushed you right over backwards. Now you're down low. Nothing was gonna happen. Oh it no, wasn't nothing a at all. Terribly and aggressive move, but I wanted to I wanted to feel you want something. Right. And I mean, here's what I did. Belt in judo. You That's absolutely could have. I'm a black belt in judo. <laughs> she push. pushed me. So I do the thing that judo trained me to do. I just let it happen. I rolled over backwards. No big and deal. And I mean, that is not a problem for me. He, you know, he, he rolled his feet right and over and popped up right up to over. standing. But no problem. But I used to think of that as, yes, that's what I do. When you push me, I move. And then I do what I want, except that you got to do the second thing. Right. And and I wasn't. And and I also learned from that little little moment of, yes. Uh, so my my unthinking response to a shove is to yield. But what about my thinking response? If I think about that situation, yielding accomplished nothing. Yeah. For like, connecting to you, it, for connecting to my wants. So if I think about that, I think, no, I should have stood there. I should have held my 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 point of view, my stance, and then worked with you on the situation from there. But instead, I just let you literally roll me over yep. and then kept doing it more metaphorically then yeah but then I, but, moved but I to a metaphorical it. stance because then you packed up your stuff and you apologize you kept apologizing yeah. for leaving and saying you could wish you wished you could stay and i will say that that has a lot to do with the this external locus of control thing feeling like my life was happening to me and i didn't have control over in fact every second of the you day which i absolutely do i mean we both do um, but you have even more yep yeah. As and, a white cisgendered man yep. in this world that um, exists as it does right now, filled with white supremacy. Yes. And yes. so you had so much privilege and so much control over what happened in your life. And I felt so frustrated at the time. I felt like I had no control yeah. over my life. I was, I wasn't really, I wasn't really in a stable situation. We weren't married yet. Um, I didn't own part of our, our, conjoined business like on paper i didn't uh our house situation was confusing as heck it was it was really rough and that that my desire to connect led me to push on you right and i it was not a violent push it was more like a a pressure honestly from where i was all you'd have to do is brush by me and i would have fallen over and that was the thing the slightest yep pressure and i would just get out of the way and you would get out of the way you would, would move with this, you would allow the momentum to just let you leave yep and that summed up Which, so much of our relating for those first well, three it, years it goes back to what you were saying about well if if i'm going to go to work anyway knowing all the choices that i have then that must be what i want to do and if you push me and i roll over and i move away that must be what I want to do. 
it's an oversimplification, but it happens to have been true of me and of this situation that you're describing. Was... And you asked what gave me, where did I get the strength to connect? Because those were in, that was an instance where I disconnected. Yeah. Where do I get the strength to connect and to want? Um, I decided somewhere along the way, that sense of the world is happening to me. I decided that's not true. You had a great analyst who helped you. I had a great analyst. That. Yes. Thayer Green I, was, oof. Dr. Green was quite, was our, quite the uh, man who, that... yeah, worked with both of us um, for quite a few years. But I remember you having a big shift when you decided to have a standpoint. Yeah. And to use that same power that lets you get out of the way at the slightest um, pressure or even just the implication that there was pressure. Yep. Yeah. Um, and I think about- You the... used it to start to like form a, yep. a stance that we could build something on. Because I didn't have to give up my stance just to, I could even yield a little bit, but I don't have to give up my stance. Yeah. And this is, so this is the message that sank in for me is to have a point of view and claim it. Not rigidly, but at least for a while, <laughs> right. which is something I hadn't done. And so it was, it was, yep, talking to Thayer was incredibly valuable. And the daily talks with you, we uncover things all the time about how connection between us works. And so communication um, between us, belief and trust in you. Which, helped so make that took it time. easier. It, it did take time. It took a long time, time for us. There, the first five years of our close relating, our intimate relating, were um, tragically troubled. Oh, yeah. I would say. Oh yeah. Um. So it's not like we jumped on, into this with some sort of skill set that just let us magically. <laughs> no. Have have this kind of um, resilience and and courage in the face of yeah. the fear of disconnection. But it's been, yeah, it's been a skill set that we've, we've developed set. together and we've relied on experts to help us develop the and skill set that have, we wanted to have. And we've taken that skill set, talking about the holidays, to help us understand what we want, what we each want yeah. out of it, and to... Um, from, uh, from this point of view that I have been developing and, and strengthening say, oh, well, no, there's actually other ways to make this happen. Other ways to have these holidays of ours that will work best for us. It will so, work better. Yeah. We had to apply us. creative yeah. curiosity mm -hmm. to figure out what the holiday collaboration would look like. There's all these C's. Creative, creative, collaborate. Collaborative yeah. So we had to break loose of the idea that life was happening to us. And yep. I think that was that was more your issue that than mine. That was very mine. much more my but issue. But I it... had to be willing to reclaim. I had always been a very strong and forthright person. And I, I was in a real lull spot where I felt disempowered. Um, I felt... I felt that I had given away my power, whatever that, you know, whatever the realistic picture is, the objective measure of that might be. And it left me feeling like the holidays just were even, even more challenging to connect because something weird was happening. I'm the extrovert. I'm gregarious. I like connection. I reach, I want, and I actually need a fair bit of alone time during the holidays. Right. I have a bunch of grief stuff that comes up every year that requires, I really want um, alone time. I need time to write. My, I, start, I sort of go into this inward hibernating phase where I want to write. Right at the same time, that you are looking for, let's watch movies together and yeah. let's sing and let's do, let's play and let's have the games and I'm going to set aside my work. And so we're a little out of sync there. Like uh, the actual rhythm of our bodies. Yep feels different. So one of the things that we've done that has been helpful for me is that we um, we make a conscious decision to increase how much sex we're having yeah. during this yeah. time because that is a way that we can connect and um, we, we, you know meet each other in a in a space sort of 
alone together. It's it, and that's something that I um the the benefits of having more sex for us in our relationship are um I I couldn't draw the lines between having more sex and what happens in the rest yeah, like, of our relationship. How but it that? has wide ranging uh impact uh, impact yeah. it, it increases our connection without anything else needing to happen yeah it's, so that's that was something we found early yep. on that without needing to really make too much of a plan simply increasing the number of times we i make myself available yep. and you make yourself available for that in other words getting into bed around uh, at approximately the same time right. at night um making sure that it's early enough so that we're not exhausted um having having the fourth the the foresight to simply make sure that in general it's a good time and that makes me wonder what else what other kinds of things might have a similar effect in our relationship in in you listeners relationships like what are the things that when you do them together Everything else goes more smoothly. your connections everywhere, everywhere yeah. else. For us, it's sex and there and a bunch are of other unexplored things. other things. Oh, you know what it is? Um, it, at Christmas time, this is going to sound so gushy, but um, I often will ask you to read to me. Either mm. read poetry yeah. or read a Christmas book. Or sometimes if I'm truly stretched, <laughs> stretched right to the edge of my capabilities with all the school and everything else, I'll ask you to read one of my textbooks to me. Not yep. a textbook, but um, like depth psychology books. They're, they tend to be very mythopoetic. I'll just ask you to read to me. And even that, it feels like you're caring for me. I'm hearing your voice. And that so we is look, a reconnection point. We look for those things that... And that was a troubleshooting thing. We had to like try a bunch of stuff because it doesn't actually work for us to simply spend more time together. J like like no, just no, spend, just, like, just like spend going time. on no, errands together. To no, does not help us... Um, decorating together does nope. not help us and some spending time like watching movies or whatever can but not all but it doesn't have to yeah so yeah it, it's it was a the the thing that you, i love about being in a relationship with you specifically is that you're such a good troubleshooter you don't get tangled up if the first thing you try doesn't work you don't expect yep. it to necessarily work and i guess that comes from your your um science background just like well you try something and then you try the next thing and then you try the next thing and it's not it's less goal oriented and more exploratory yeah so do this did it work did it not that's information and i am so directive and goal oriented that yeah. that's very helpful for me you keep me in a in a generative state of like okay let's just try stuff out and, and so it, that's how we've figured out how to connect is actually practice yep. over the years and not getting caught too caught up in the idea that we have to repeat the same things over and over again and the holidays bring us back to that idea of tradition yeah and we often will just repeat year after year the same exact things even yeah. if those things were fighting misery disconnection frustration <laughs> yeah. anger right. we'll repeat just them anyways we seek them out them. we'll repeat them and Freud didn't get everything wrong. Repetition, compulsion's a thing. But, um, That's for sure. You know, he has his problems. But that and one. <laughs> we had some pretty significant experiences, uh, some, some counter examples to that. So we don't celebrate the holidays on the days that everybody else does. Oh, right. We celebrate a little um, bit differently because we have a blended family. And and there was, a, there was a period of time where that felt like having given something away, given something up. Like, okay, so we... We do our full Christmas day on um, the Christ 24th yeah. and we do Thanksgiving on the Saturday after Thanksgiving. And we just planned that so that like forever, we for when the kids were little, they didn't have to be moving back and forth on these. And they days. didn't have to know like what year it was they or whatever. Yeah. So it was all we simplified it for ourselves. But there was a time where it felt like giving something away. But as time went on. It felt more like claiming what made sense for us, and we built it into yeah. It's it's our success. we normed we normed on yep. it, and <clears throat> it made it so that yeah, even though it was different, it's it's ours, and it is very connecting. We're celebrating on a day when nobody else is. There's something about that yeah. for our little family. That here. was an unexpected. Okay, not so little, but you know, <laughs> yeah. it was um, an unexpected impact that everybody feels it we're we're all together here doing, doing this thing, thing doing our thing and it, it brings us all 
together. And that goes for you and I, um, you know, with kids going back and forth to other houses, we've yep. had days like Thanksgiving that have just been just us, just us and not a celebration. They weren't the day we were celebrating. We used to call it naked Thursday. The kids are here more, so more of them live with us full time like these that, days. But... Um, so it's not naked Thursday anymore, but Boy, I loved Naked Thursday. That yeah. was that was a holiday to yeah. keep in the books. And now we've started having hotel days, which are a hotel days are wonderful. We, in other words, we just pretend the house is a hotel. We put out fancy water in fancy water dispensers, and we'll order in some food and yeah. sit by the fire outside and just pretend the house is a hotel. And it works. It works. It works. So yeah, I think courageous connecting for me at this point is about continually troubleshooting this relationship and being figuring willing out what's going to look what's at work what's now. being willing to look at what's not working. Yeah. It's great. It's great to settle into the things that do work, but okay, look at those other things too. Have the, you know, if you can and, find the strength and courage to go look at them and work at And work each of on us them. have our standpoint and not be afraid to claim it and at the same time be flexible yep. to create the next new thing. Right. I'm really lucky to do this with you. Oh, it's, I'm honored and lucky. Thanks. You're good at it. So I hope that you all tune in next time because, yeah, we'll be back at this and yeah. hitting the second half of the book coming up. So thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. In episode six, Ken and I talked about how much trial and error it took to figure out how to make it through the holidays with a little bit of grace. We noticed how differently we approached the feeling of wanting and remembered what it was like when Ken didn't feel secure enough to really own his wants and how that frustrated me and brought us to the brink more than a few times. Connection in the midst of holiday pressures and unspoken agreements have caused us lots of heartache, but it's also given us the opportunity to create traditions that we would never have imagined individually. I hope you find the courage to own a bit more of your wanting, your desire this season, even in the face of not knowing whether that want will be met. The potential for knowing yourself better is buried in that feeling of desire. Join us next time when we explore the differences in explicit versus implicit communication styles and how making one million early mistakes <laughs> led us to a process that we can depend on to get us through even highly intense periods of stress and come out on the other side even more in love. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news. <laughs>